All right, um, let's get started. So um, today we'll talk about the survival analysis, which is another class of models um, that's beyond uh, the linear regression, uh, but it's also um, parametric. Um, so survival analysis is the background is when we have something um, that we not only care about whether uh, that event happens, but also when it happens. Okay, so that's the focus. Um, so for example, if you have a drug um, to cure some disease um, and then uh, the outcome would uh, not only be whether people die from that disease, but also um, when they die, right? Because everyone eventually dies. Uh, so the timing uh, is actually the most important thing. Second example, um, if you're looking at the unemployed workers and you want to know how the unemployment benefits affects uh, how they find jobs. Um, so here the outcome is not only whether they find jobs, but also when they find jobs, uh, whether they find jobs after one year, two years or five years. And that's um, the thing that matters the most. Um, and third, in finance, uh, suppose you're a mortgage lender and you are you have some borrowers, okay, uh, who have mortgages. And then when we predict uh, when they default on that, whether there's a delinquency or um, default, uh, and the outcome is not only whether there's a default or whether there's a payment, but also whether the payments are on time. Um, so all of these cases, we are care about the timing of these events. Um, so that's what the survival analysis is for, okay? But here it's still not obvious, right? Why we need an entire uh, different class of models for these kind of questions, uh, because you can, uh, in principle, you can just use the timing as the dependent variable, and then you can do uh, regression or uh, the old stuff again. Uh, so we'll talk about that in two slides, why when you have the dependent variable to be the timing, and then um, actually you need this class of models, otherwise there will be bias, okay? Uh, but the focus here is the timing of some events, uh, and that's the kind of problems that we're gonna work with. Um, and it's only for this type of problems that survival analysis is particularly useful. Um, so these events can be anything, okay? It can be stock market crashes, it can be defaults, it can be bankruptcies. Um, and traditionally this is, uh, the application is our first example um, to study the effectiveness of some drug and you look at when people die. Um, and that's where the name survival analysis comes from, uh, but it's also called duration analysis. It's the same thing. And then there's one feature uh, that makes the traditional methods not great, uh, and that's sensory. Okay, so we'll uh, talk about that. Uh, just let's understand that through this example. So the example here, we have some uh, inmates, okay, in the prison, um, and then they're released from the prison, and then we want to see uh, whether uh, they have another arrest, okay? So whether they commit some crime again. Um, and then we want to see uh, what are the determine, what are the things that uh, determine whether uh, they have an arrest again, uh, whether the age matters or uh, whether the number of previous convictions uh, predict that. So when you take this data set, um, your X variable are these information, right? The age, uh, number of previous convictions and so on. And then your Y variable would be, uh, first you can take the Y variable to be whether they are arrested or not. Okay, so that is a zero one variable, right? 
And that's a kind of situation we should use logit regression uh, because it's a classification model. Um, so when you do that, the problem is, of course, uh, you are ignoring the timing of the arrests, okay? Because you're only counting whether they're arrested or not, but not when they arrest. Um, and the timing actually matters a lot, right? If they are commit another crime just one week after they're released or uh, like two years after they're released, then that's uh, very, two very different situations um, and you should treat, treat them differently. Uh, but here it's just, they're both equals to one. So then we want to take that timing into account. Uh, then there's this option you just take the dependent variable to be the time between their release and their first arrest. Okay. And that addresses this problem, right? Because for this case, that dependent variable equals to one uh, or it equals to 52. So they're actually different. But then uh, there is another problem. Um, and that's called censoring. So this problem is that there are some people who are just never arrested, okay, for the time period that you're looking at. So for example, we follow all of these people for um, one year or two years. And during that time, uh, they don't commit a crime, but that doesn't mean they will never, uh, they will never commit a crime, right? Um, so maybe their dependent variable is equal to three, but you just don't observe that. Um, so that's called censoring. So it means that for some part of the population, for some part of the sample, um, their dependent variable, uh, you don't observe their true dependent variable. So you only know that uh, their Y variable is greater or equal to something but you don't know the exact value, okay? So for example, if you only follow these people for two years and they don't commit a crime, you know that their Y variable, that time between release and arrest is greater than two. But what it equals exactly, you don't know, right? It can be three, it can be four, it can be five. So that's uh, the issue that we are dealing with here. Um, and then uh, let's just look at another example. Um, so here, uh, let's say this is some product, okay? So um, let's say it's some game that people play and um, the users only play that game for, uh, for a certain amount of time and then they're bored with it and they, uh, they stop playing. And um, each line here. Uh, so all of these are time, okay? And then this dash line is our current time T. And then all of these lines, each line is one person, okay? And then for example, this person right here, this first red line, uh, are, this person starts playing at this time and then stops playing at this time. And then the second one, the blue line, uh, the person starts playing at this time, and then he continues to play until the time that we observe them, okay? And then the third person, again, starts playing at this time, and then uh, stops playing at this time. Okay, and each line is a different person, and that's um, our data. So now, um, if, we want to predict, okay? So for example, if um, teenagers like this game more or the 20 year olds um, or like do uh, males love it more or females? Um, and then we can regress our dependent variable on all of these characteristics of the players. Um, and then there are several choices, right? If you're going to do this with just linear regression. So uh, you could just take the time. So for example, the first person 
the time that uh, the person plays is equals to this, the length of this uh, period. And then that's the dependent variable that we're gonna use. Um, and then we have a problem with the second person, right? Because the second person, you know that uh, he plays it for at least this time, but you don't know when he is actually gonna quit. Um, so he can quit here or he can quit even later. Um, so then you don't know about this person's um, dependent variable. And then uh, one choice is that you can just take this person's dependent variable to be this value that we observe, but of course that's gonna be wrong, right? Because that's not the actual time that the person plays. Um, it can be longer, a little longer or much longer. We, don't know anything about it. Then uh, the second choice is just to throw this person away. So you can just, all of these blue, blue lines, um, you only um, know that they play until today, but you don't know the exact time period. So you can just drop these people and then only keep these red people where you see exactly when they started playing and when they quit, okay? And then that seems to be a better solution, right? But there is also a problem because you are dropping part of the sample and the sample you're dropping is not random, okay? And then that introduces a selection bias uh, because the ones that are more likely to be dropped by you are these people who are still playing until today, right? So those people are probably the people who are playing the game longer. Um, and then when you are dropping conditional on, they have already played a long time. And then um, that's gonna create issues, right? Because um, that will lead to a bias um, because this is a very selected sample and you're actually selecting on this Y variable. Okay, so both of these, um, options are not viable. Um, so then we need another way to deal with this censorship problem. Okay. So here this graph uh, shows you the actual time they play. Um, so when you see all of the data, of course, now you can just take the length of uh, the period for everybody and then do a regression, that will be fine. However, in reality, we don't see all of this, okay? Uh, so all of this will happen in the future, but at this time point, all we know is that they are still playing, but we don't know when they will quit in the future. Um, so then no matter all the, the two approaches that I mentioned, either to impute their value or to drop these people would both create biases. Um, okay, so that's what um, the survival analysis is gonna deal with. Okay. And then um, lots of examples like this, right? So uh, for all of these examples, uh, you can just label uh, the time they start playing as the birth, okay? The time that they quit as the death, and then um, first example is, uh, this is a product. It's just like the game that we just described, right? People join Spotify and then people um, quit their membership. And then uh, the censoring issue there is that um, at the current time, we don't know, uh, it's exactly like this. We don't know in the future when they are gonna quit their membership. Um, and then second example, um, you have couples start dating and that's the birth. Uh, and then they break up is the death. And then censoring is that some people just don't never break up, right? Or they will break up in the future, but you don't know when. Um, so that's um, also something that we don't observe. Um, and then third is uh, birth firm is established, death is firm goes bankrupt. And we're interested in 
what determines uh, when firms gonna go bankrupt. And then the censoring is some firms just never go bankrupt or they will probably go bankrupt in the future, but I don't know when. Um, for mortgage, uh, the birth is when it's originated. The death is when someone defaults, but uh, maybe it just matures early or uh, defaults in the future and you don't know. Okay, so there are many, many examples in finance and outside of finance um, on this, uh, like this kind, okay? And especially it's very useful for the kind of um, credit, like mortgage related type of questions where you want to predict uh, when someone is gonna default or when someone is gonna be delinquent. Um, and that timing is super important, right? Because time is money. Um, and then uh, this, uh, the models that we're gonna talk, talk about today will uh, come in handy. Okay, um, so let's, I'll come back to this graph later. Um, so the approach that we're gonna take is to just think of this um, time pe period, um, T. Okay, so this T is the amount of time they spend on playing the game from the beginning to the end, um, or uh, the amount of time people survive after uh, taking that medicine, or uh, the amount of time between the loan originates and the loan uh, defaults okay so that's the duration that we want to estimate so we just treat this as a random variable okay and any random variable would have a probability distribution and then um, we have three ways to describe that probability distribution um, so all of these three things once you know one of them you also know the other two so the first is a cumulative distribution function uh, cdf Okay, um, and then the second is probability density function, the PDF. So we already know about those two. Um, and the third one is new, uh, and that one is actually uh, the hazard function. So that's uh, what I'm gonna talk about next. Um, but first, uh, just look at this graph. Okay, so what this graph is, um, it plots the percentage of people that are still remaining, um, that are still surviving, quote unquote, okay? Um, so the x-axis here is the time, um, is the time. So you have the time goes from zero to 10 month, 20 month, 30 month, et cetera, okay? Um, and then you have the percentage of people that are still have not died yet or have not quit it yet. And then at first it's always a hundred percent, right? They are all still in the game. And then that number declines over time as people leave or dies. Um, and then that goes down over time. Okay, so this is um, this is the distribution of the duration that we're gonna see, okay? Um, and this describes um, how many people survive until how many months. Um, so this is exactly the function that we're gonna estimate. But if you think about this function, okay? Um, at each point in time, so uh, for example, if we take the 20 month, mark. And then what this number tells you, 80%, uh, is, um, is the percentage of people that are still remaining. Okay. And then that is also the percentage of people with their time greater or equal to 20. Right? That's just the same way as saying um, the, the 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 percentage of people who are uh, who are still remaining uh, at tw twenty months, which means that the actual duration is longer than twenty months, right? So then, what that is is one minus the probability of t smaller than twenty, right? 
and then that is um, so the probability of t is smaller than 20 is just the CDF at 20, right? Because the definition of the cumulative uh, probability function, a cumulative uh, distribution function uh, is the probability that that random variable is smaller than some value. Okay, so the CDF at uh, the value 20 is the probability that this random variable is uh, smaller than 20, which is exactly this. Okay, and that's true for every time, okay? Uh, th so this 20 can be any number. Um, then what this, uh, the value at time t will just be equal to one minus ft, where f is the CDF. Okay, so this is almost the same as uh, the CDF, this very intuitive function that we're plotting, which is the percentage of people um, that are still remaining uh, in this game is just one minus the CDF, okay? So that uh, corresponds one to one to the CDF. So if we want to estimate this function, we just est well, we just need to estimate the CDF, okay? Um, so that's why we want to know these things. Uh, once we know the CDF, we can just use one minus that to get that, fu that function uh, that tells us how many people are still surviving at each point. And then once we know the PDF, we can also just integrate that to get the CDF. Okay, so this is just what I was talking about. So that function that I was just plotting is called the survival function. And let's denote it by this big letter S and that just equals to one minus the CDF uh, at the value T. And the definition of that is the probability that uh, this random variable is greater than uh, that value. Okay. And um, the duration T cannot be negative. Okay, so at time zero, which is the very beginning, um, the survival function is equal to one, which means that 100% of the people are in the game at the very beginning, uh, but over time that declines. And then the PDF, uh, the probability distribution function is equal to the derivative of the CDF, right? And then that just equals to negative uh, derivative of the survival function. Okay, so that's the relationship between these things. Uh, once you know the CDF, you know the survival function and you know the PDF. And now let's uh, talk about the third way of describing this function, which is the hazard function. So what is hazard? Um, so its definition is kind of like the PDF, okay? Um, if the PDF is the probability that uh, the random variable is in the small region around that T uh, and divide by the length of that region. And then the hazard function is the only difference is that it's conditional on that people have already survived until that point. So it's conditional on this random variable is already bigger or equal to T. And then once you calculate that, it will just be equal to the little f. This is the PDF divided by the ST. This is the survival function. Okay. So that's the definition of the hazard. Um, and we have this definition. Um, because it is a more intuitive concept in the case um, of the survival analysis. So let's say uh, the hazard rate is 0.15. Um, and then the time, the unit of the time here is years. And then what that means is conditional on that you have already survived until now. 
the probability of you uh, defaulting in the next year is just 15%, which is this density uh, times the time, uh, one year, and that's 15%, okay? So this is called the conditional density because it's just the probability density, but conditional on um, you have already surviving until that point. And another way to think about it is um, if the example, um, if the hazard rate for death is equal to 2% per year. And then what that means is at each point, the probability of you uh, dying in the next year is 2%, okay? And then in next year, conditional on you surviving until then, the probability of you dying the year after next year is 2%. And so on and so on. So then, uh, if that hazard rate still uh, remains constant, then you should expect to live another fifty years because each year the probability of you dying is two percent. Okay. So that's uh, the hazard function, and you can see that it's just a function of the PDF and uh, the survival function, which is one minus the CDF. And the PDF is also a function of the CDF. So this is just a function of the CDF and it corresponds one to one to the CDF. So as I said, these three things right here, the CDF, PDF, and hazard function, once you know one of them, you know all of them, okay? Um, so now let's uh, just see if for example, if you know that hazard function, how do you get back to the survival function? So to do that, um, you just integrate uh, this function, okay? Because uh, if you take the derivative of the log of the survival function, and that would just be equal to uh, using the chain rule um, is one minus ST multiplied by um, st taking derivative to t would just be minus ft, okay? So that equals to this, and then you can integrate on this uh, two sides. But that's just uh, some algebra. And then um, once you know the uh, hazard function, you can just integrate that to get the survival function. Um, and then let's look at some examples of the hazard function. Okay, so there are several ones that we often um, use. The first one is um, a constant hazard. Okay, so the hazard function is equal to a constant over time. So that's kind of like our example here. Um, the hazard of death is 2% per year and that stays constant. And then once you have that, um, the survival function just equals to e to the minus lambda t, okay? Uh, lambda is this constant that it's equal to. Um, and if you plot that, it will be something like this, okay? Um, and at zero, it equals to one, and then you have this um, death over time, and then that is decreasing. And then you can also calculate the PDF. Okay, and that's what we call the exponential distribution. Um, and then another example is the log of the hazard function is equal to a constant plus alpha t. So that's just a linear function of t. And then the hazard would be the natural exponential of that. Um, and then you can also integrate that to get the CDF. And this one in particular is called the Gumpers distribution. Okay. Um, and in this case, the log hazard is just equals to a linear function of T or the hazard, um, the log of hazard can be a linear function of the log T. And in this case, the hazard equals to Lambda, some constant times T to the alpha. 
Okay, and then this is called the Weibo distribution, uh, another one that that's often used. Um, so all of this will be used in the uh, Cox proportional hazard model uh, that we talk about later. So this Weibo distribution, actually, if you look at it, um, it's very flexible. Okay. So here, uh, it will always be an increasing relationship, which means that over time, uh, well, the constant hazard model means that the probability of you dying in the next year is always the same. And that's not a very good uh, assumption, right? Because when you're young, the probability of dying in the next year is very low. And when you're old, it's very high. Um, so here, this Gumpers distribution takes into account of that, right? So you have this increasing hazard over time. Uh, when you're young, the hazard is very low. And when you're old, the probability of dying is very high. And then the Weibo distribution, um, because it is T to the alpha, and that alpha can be either positive or negative or zero. So then your hazard can be a positive relationship if the alpha is positive, like this black line here, um, or it can be a constant if alpha equals to zero. And then we're back to the um, first case with the exponential distribution. Uh, and that's the red line. And or if you have alpha is negative, it can also be uh, a declining relationship, which means that hazard is declining over time. Okay, and that might be the case for um, for default, right? If uh, a company is gonna default, if a borrower is gonna default, then most of that default will happen sooner rather than later, right? Um, so when you have a negative alpha, you can get that. So this one is the most flexible one. So what, sorry, what determines the alpha range? Uh, is it the data or? Yeah, that's something that we're going to ask me. Okay. Well, not exactly, but but you'll see later. Um, so here I'm just showing some examples um, of how this different hazard rate, uh, how this different functional forms that you choose can map into um, the different relationships of the hazard rate. So it can be either increasing or decreasing or constant, depending on what um, your data actually is. Yeah, so the short answer is uh, the alpha will be determined by the data. Okay, so then uh, that's kind of the broad concept. Um, so it's not much here, right? Uh, we already know the CDF and PDF and hazard function is just some function of that, um, which is the conditional density. And then um, the next we're gonna talk about is how to estimate um, this CDF or PDF or hazard. Okay. And usually when we get um, a model, sorry, when we get some data that we need to do um, survival analysis, there are broadly uh, two things that we want to do. The first is just to estimate the survival function. Okay. So you want to get that function that we looked at earlier, uh, where it shows you how what fraction of people are still remaining at each time point. So that decreasing relationship. That's the first, uh, well, the first thing we wanna do. And the second thing we wanna do is to see how the different characteristics of the people affect their survival rate. Okay, so for example, uh, if it's uh, the default rate of some firm, you want to know uh, whether that firm's investment or um, industry or other characteristics, how does that affect the default rate over time? And whether, uh, for example, the uh, firms in more volatile industries, maybe they're more likely to default. So that's something you can test. Okay. Um, so that's the two broad things that we want to do 
to do the first thing to estimate that survival function, there are these two non-parametric methods. Okay, non-parametric in the sense that we talked about last week, you don't have a functional form here. Um, everything is just estimated from the data. Um, so the workhorse model, um, there you're gonna see 99% of the time to estimate a survival analysis model is the Cox regression method that we're gonna talk about later. But first let's see these two non-parametric ways. Um, so these are just ways to estimate the survival curves, but they don't tell you exactly how these different characteristics affect that survival rate. Okay, so the first way, um, is um, both of these, uh, we want to know what is the CDF, okay? And the CDF uh, is just one minus the survival function. Um, so knowing one, you also know the other. And to estimate some uh, CDF, uh, you just need, uh, for any data, you just need to know uh, if you take n independent observations um, and then what is the probability that it's below some value, okay? And what, how many observations are below that value, okay? If, so for example, uh, if 75% of the observations have event times greater than five, and then uh, the survival function is 75%, which means that at five years, still 75% of the people are remaining. Okay, and that's something you can observe from the data, right? However, the only complication is that uh, there is the censoring issue where for some people you don't see their exact time uh, of remaining, okay? And um, that's actually very, a little hard to deal with um, because for example, uh, different people start at different times. Okay, just like the first uh, example that we see. So, um, let me show that figure again. Just like this example that we see, um, so for example, uh, this person, um, survives a really long time, but still you see the beginning and the end, okay? Um, however, this person, um, you only know that it also survives the same amount of time, but you only see this very small part of it. So you only the only thing you know is, the only information you have is that this person survives longer than this small amount of time, okay? So um, you have these different pers different people that start at all at different times. Um, so then if you put all of them to be starting from zero, okay? So if you pull all of lines to the left and then at each time point, you can see that some people are actually quitting and some people are censored, okay? Uh, so for example, at two years, maybe some people are censored, some people are uh, quitting, but some people are quitting at three years and some people are censored at three years and so on. Um, and then um, the way we deal with that is first way is called the life tables. Okay. And um, this is first used in the um, actuarial science, like for insurance. Um, and what that, what that does is you take the total amount of time, okay? And then uh, you divide that into these different intervals. Um, so the first interval starts from zero to some T1, and then second interval is T1 to T2, et cetera. And at each interval, you can see uh, how many people are still alive at the beginning of that interval, okay? 
And then uh, you also see, and let's call that Nj uh, for this interval J. And then the number of people who died during that interval is called Dj. And then there may be also some people who just got censored, okay? And these people are the LJs. And we are actually dividing that by two because um, if they're censored, they can be censored at any time uh, between these two points. So we just take the average. Uh, but that's a, that's a minor thing. Okay, so then um, what we calculate is the probability of dying during that interval conditional on surviving until the beginning of the interval. Okay, so first you conditional on the people who survive until the beginning of that interval. And this is the group of people with NJ people. Okay, and among that NJ people, this LJ people have been censored. So you don't know whatever happened to them. So that should not be in your denominator. And then uh, the amount of people who die is DJ. So you use DJ divide by the amount of people you start with minus the amount of people are, who are censored. And that's the probability of dying within that period or within that interval conditional on you surviving until the beginning of that interval. And then um, you can just multiply that over time from the first interval to the uh, kth interval, okay? So for example, if you wanna know what is the probability of surviving to time TK, uh, and this TK is the end of the kth interval, and then the probability of you surviving until the end of the first interval is one minus P1, right? And then conditional on that, the probability you can survive until the second interval is one minus P2. So you multiply that, that would be the amount, that would be the total probability of you surviving until the end of uh, interval two. And then if you wanna know uh, the probability you survive until the end of uh, interval three, you just multiply that by one minus P3, et cetera, et cetera. So you can multiply that all the way until one minus PK. And that tells you um, the probability that you can survive all the way to the end of the kth interval. Okay. Um, and, and this uh, is exactly what uh, we said here. Uh, for the kth interval, you can just multiply all of them together. And then we, this is already STK. Right, that's the value of the survival function at uh, the time TK. And then you can do this for the end of every interval. And then you have uh, the value of S at all of these points. And then you can connect them. That gives you the entire S function. Okay, so that's the, that's the first method called life tables. You're just dividing into these intervals. And then for each interval, you can calculate the probability of dying um, conditional on you already survived to the beginning of that interval. And then you just multiply that over time to get the value at each point. Then the second one is called the Kaplan-Meier method. So it's a little bit different uh, in the sense that we're not doing the intervals here, but we're just take, taking the, um, event times. So these are the times that somebody have quit it or somebody have died. Okay. And at each time you can calculate how many individuals um, are at that time. So they can die at that time. Everyone that are already censored or have already died before does not uh, enter this in. Okay. And then, uh, you have this time because somebody have quit it at that time. So this uh, D DI is the amount of people who have died at that time. And then um, 
you can do the same thing as before okay uh, for each time uh, you can just calculate one minus uh, di dj over nj which is the probability conditional probability of you dying at that time uh, conditional on you already surviving until that time Okay, so all of this is a little bit abstract, but let's look at an example here. Um, so here is uh, an example. So you have a hundred people. Um, so let's try the Kaplan-Meier method, okay? Let's say you have a hundred people participating in the clinical trial uh, for some drug, okay? And a hundred is the number you start with. And then at T equals to two, after two years, 10 people died. And then after three years, five people died. Okay. And then uh, what is the survival function at three years according to this method? So the way we calculate that, um, is at two years, right? There are two event times here, uh, t equals to two and t equals to three. Those are the two times that someone have died. And then for the first time, uh, there is a hundred people, right? So that's one minus uh, people who died at that time is 10. Divide by 100 is the people that are still surviving at that point. Okay. And then we want to know at three years. So we also need to divide, uh, need to multiply the second uh, point, right? You need to take all the points that are smaller or equal to the point that you're evaluating. Um, so that would be one minus the people that died at period two. Uh, sorry, at t equals to three is equal to five, uh, divide by the people who are still alive at that time, okay? Who could have died at that time. So the, that number is what? 90. 90, great. Um, so that would be your st uh, at t equals to three. Okay, and this is just um, 0.9 times uh, 85 over 90, or whatever that is, okay. And now let's look at another example. Um, again, we have 100 people who are participating in this clinical trial. And then at two years, 10 people have died. Okay, same as before, at three years, five people have died. However, another 10 people, um, they start at different times, okay? They start a little bit later. Uh, so we only know that they're still alive at two years, but we don't observe them after two years, okay? So we know that they, they live longer than two years, but how many years exactly, we don't know. So now uh, let's do this calculation again for the survival curve at three years. So first we have one minus, uh, again, these two event times, right? So for the first event time, uh, the people who have died is 10 and people who could have died is 100, right? And I think that's um, not ambiguous. And then times uh, the second time point t equals to three, the people who died at that time is five. The people who could have died is what? 90. 90? It's not 90 anymore, okay? Before well, it was 100, 100, right? It's also not 100, it's 80, okay? 80? These are, okay, so these NJ is the people who are at risk of event, meaning that uh, either they have already died or they have, um, sorry, they have not already died or they have not already been censored. However, there are 10 people who are censored, 
which means that these 10 people, they are not at risk of dying at the three-year point because they have already been gone after two years, okay? You don't know whether they have died um, or not. Are they two, sorry, are the 10 people included in the original 100? Yes, yes. They are all in this original 100, but they just start at different times. So for these 10 people, you only know that they live um, two years or longer. However, they could live, uh, maybe they have only lived two and a half years, right? Um, and in that case, you should not include them. And maybe they actually lived four years, but you don't know that. Um, they could very well just lived two and a half years. Okay. So then you should not include them in the calculation for the time point of three years, because you don't know whether they will last until three years or not. And here you should only count the people who you know for sure that are still alive at three years. And those are the at-risk people. These 10 people are not at risk at that point, okay? And that number is 80 because it would be 100 times these 10 people who have already died after two years, and then minus that 10 people who are censored. So you also don't know whether they're still alive at three years. So these 80 people, you know for sure that they're still alive at three years, and then five of them died. And that uh, would be 0.9 times 75 over 80. Okay. Professor, uh, does that underestimate the survivor, like the, the, like the probability of survivorship? In, like, does that underestimate it? Uh, sorry, I didn't get your question. Could you say yeah. again? Uh, if we include, like, uh, like after we include the, the the censorship in this data, we actually underestimate the the survival uh probability in like in three years, like so so we actually underestimate the survival if we don't like compared to the last example. So do we actually underestimate it or? No, we're not. Um, so both of these methods, uh, when you're using this or you're using the life tables, you're always, uh, for, for life tables, if you have an interval, you're also dropping everyone who have already been censored before. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is not, a, uh, an uh, underestimation or overestimation because for those people, you don't know which exact year they die after two years. So when you are calculating the probability, um, so this is kind of the conditional density uh, at that three years, you should not take into account those 10 people. I don't know if that answers your question. Um, I think you're sort of saying these two are not comparable, kind of, but uh, but this right here um, is at the beginning, right? So there are 100 people, um, and this is at the three years, and there's only 80 people that you know have for sure survived three years. But those 10 people, you, you don't know, so you cannot include them. Okay. So how, yeah. can we uh, like if if you can include them, you could be wrong, right? Maybe they maybe they have already died before three years, um, and then that will actually lead to a um, overestimation of your density. But uh, but my 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 question is more like if if they don't if they if they survive in three years, like. But yeah. that's a that's a if, right? You don't know that. Um, so it, 
it's like it's distorted from the actual survival probability, right? That if we right, if but but the data you have is not complete, right? So you you can only whatever estimation you do, you can only take the data you have. You cannot just create some new data. Um, so, so my question is more like, is there any way that I, we can get around this problem? Well, this is here, we are already getting around that problem. We're just not taking them into account. Uh, but that's not a bias in any way because um, because these, these people are just missing, right? Um, and when you're dropping people who are missing, that's not a bias. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know if that makes too much sense because we're not selecting on any variable here. Um, these people, you just don't have the information. Um, so that should not be taken into account in this calculation. We're not assuming yeah, they live. That. We're not assuming they live longer than three years, or we're not longer than two years, right? Uh, longer than two years, you know that, yes. So but but you don't know the three died? years. Sorry. Oh, can we treat this another ten people, and they were uh, alive at? two years so i mean can we treat and this another 10 people as they already died so we uh add this another 10 people to the um to the first uh first ng the uh, dj like 100 uh, 20 divided by 100 1 minus 20 divided by 100 times 1 minus 5 divided by 80. um okay. sorry you're saying 20 so you want to make it 20 here where? Yeah. Yes, right here. Right there. Okay, but no, they they are alive at two years. But um, okay, so let me go back to that graph. Okay. Yeah, so here, um, this is the actual data, right? But you don't observe that. What you only observe is this. So then uh, like these people, when you only see this small amount, you don't know whether, how, when they actually gonna die, right? Um, they could just die right here uh, or they could last really long. Um, and then that's the underlying data, but you don't see that. So then when you calculate um, for this person, uh, you can only take that person into account when you are calculating the probability for uh, some very low period. Uh, but for some very long period, um, you don't know if this person already survives until that point. So you just should drop this person because we're doing this conditional density over time, right? Um, and for each point, we should just only consider people who have survived until that point because we're conditional. Um, all of this is conditional density. Okay. Um, and this person does not survive until that point. We don't, uh, it could eventually, but we don't know that. So then for that conditional, density, we should just not include this person. Um, all right. Okay, got it. Um, yeah, because both of these methods, they are like life tables is the probability of dying um, in that interval conditional on you surviving until the beginning of the interval, right? So that's conditional on. Um, and you must know for oh, sure that they survive until that point. And here okay. as well, uh, it's at risk of the event. So that's conditional on you already survive until that point. So 
you should only include people who survive until that point. That's that's what conditional means. Um, okay, thank you. So then these two, um, they are kind of similar, uh, but they are useful in different uh, cases. So the Kaplan-Meier, which is the second one we're talking about, where you have these different event times, it's more suitable when you, first of all, you measure the event times super precisely, okay? Because that's all based on these uh, times that people died. Um, so that has to be precise. And also it's useful when the number of observations is small uh, because for example, if you have like uh, millions of people and then you could have millions of time points and that would be a lot of calculation for this method. However, the live table method is better uh, for larger data sets because you can, even if it's a million people, you can still divide it into 10 intervals, right? And then for each interval, you can do that calculation. Um, or it's useful when the measurement of the event times is crude because the uh, as long as you get the intervals correct, uh, it doesn't have to, it can be any time within that interval. Um, but then the downside is that the choice of intervals is a little bit arbitrary. Okay. Um, so I think in the programming exercise, we're gonna do the first one. Uh, because we don't have a huge data set there. Okay, um, so now let's talk about um, the main model for this um, survival analysis, which is the Cox proportional hazard model. So you may heard about this before because whenever people do a uh, survival analysis, this is the first model that would come to mind, okay. Um, So that model is useful for uh, if we want to use the characteristics, uh, some X variables to predict um, when you're gonna fail or when you're gonna die um, and how long you're gonna last, okay? Um, and the first two methods are not super useful for that, right? Because that only tells you the survival function for everybody. And then you, you can probably divide the sample and see for each subsample what that survival function looks like and compare it. Uh, but it's still a non-parametric method, which means that uh, you don't get to know when some characteristics change, how does that survival function change? So for that, you need a little bit more parametric approach like the regression. Um, Okay, so Cox proportional hazard model is basically a way to run regression with this uh, survival analysis data. So um, this X variable, um, we have a T uh, notation here, right? So it can be time varying. Um, your survival in the future could depend on your axis at this time point. Um, so it can either be time dependent or time independent. Okay. Um, so now let's talk about uh, this model. So basically uh, we are modeling our hazard function. Okay, remember that hazard function is the PDF divided by the survival function, okay. Uh, which is the conditional density at each point. So we are modeling that hazard function as a specific functional form. And that is lambda zero T, okay? So you can think of this as a like a constant. Um, it's only a function of T, but does not depend on X. And then you have the second part, which depend on X, which is the natural exponential of beta times x, okay? So inside this uh, exponential, it's just a linear function of x. So why do we choose this weird uh, form? It's because um, once we have this, then if you compare the hazard rate of two people, uh, let's call it person i and person j, and then you can divide the hazard rate of person I by the hazard rate of person J. 
and this lambda term will just cancel out, right? Doesn't matter. Um, but then what's gonna left is the natural exponential of the linear functions of the differences in the axis. Okay. Um, and then this function here is only a function of X. Um, and if X is time invariant, then it's not even a function of T. Um, so then that's why this is called proportional hazard model because um, the hazard of each two individuals, they are always proportional to each other. Um, and the ratio of those two is equal to this number. So let's understand this uh, a little bit more. Uh, so you can also take the log of that function, of that hazard function, and then that equals to alpha t. Okay. So let me just write it here so it's easier to see how this. So the hazard function is lambda zero t times e to the beta xt. Okay. So um, if you take the log, that would be just log of lambda zero t and we call that alpha t. And then the second part is the beta xt. And then you can have all kinds of models using this simple form, okay? If uh, it does not depend on x, it's just a constant, then we have the exponential model. If uh, the alpha t equals to a linear function of t, and then we have the Gumpers model. If we have, if the alpha t equals to alpha times log t, we have the Weibull model. Okay, so we can have all of those kinds of models from this form. Okay, but uh, whatever alpha you take, the second part is the same. And because of that, it will still make our hazard function proportional to each other. Okay, and then how do we estimate this? Um, two approaches. One is parametric, second one is semi-parametric. Okay, so let's first talk about the parametric one. Um, the parametric one is used uh, less often, okay? But uh, basically it is, you can choose an alpha so you can choose the exponential or Gumpers or Weibo, any of them. Um, and then you have a parameter, right? Alpha, and then you have a parameter beta. And then for each X, you can calculate what is the hazard rate for that person. Once you have the hazard rate, that basically gives you the distribution of the variable T. And when you have the distribution, you can calculate the likelihood, right? And once you have the likelihood, you can do maximum likelihood to just choose your parameters to maximize that likelihood. So that's the idea. So first you pick any alpha um, and then um, the likelihood of observing on the observation uh, with some duration ti would just be one. Would just be the PDF, right? FTI. Right, this is the same way as we do the maximum likelihood for the uh, linear regression. Uh, we can also assume the error terms are normal and then uh, for each observation, the probability is just a PDF of the normal distribution at that point, okay? So that's uh, the likelihood. And then um, remember the big issue about survival analysis is that we have um, the sensory, right? So there are some people who we don't observe the exact duration, we only know that their duration is bigger than something. Um, so then, uh, so for, for this first case, you have the PDF FTI. For the second case, 
the likelihood of of of, of uh, observing the something uh, being censored at TI is the probability of uh, your T is greater than TI, and that's equal to um, one minus FTI or STI, right? That's your survival function. Um, and that's your probability of you surviving longer than that point. And those are for the sensor observations because for those observations, the only thing we know that it's bigger than something, but we don't know the exact time. But for the ones we know the exact time, we can just use the PD PDF. And that's uh, the likelihood for everybody. Then we can just multiply them together. That will be the total likelihood of observing the entire data. Um, and you have these two cases where you're not censored, then it's the PDF. If you're censored, it's the survival function. And then you can just maximize that likelihood uh, with respect to alpha and beta. So that allow you to estimate um, the values of alpha and beta. It's just the values that maximize the likelihood. Um, and then once you have the alphas and betas, then you also have the survival function of everybody. Okay, you just substitute in here. Um, and then you have the X for someone and then you know, based on their X, what their survival function is. And that's this approach. But then uh, the thing that we don't like as much is you have to specify the lambda, okay? You have to still have to choose a lambda because um, you have to choose to be either the exponential or Gompers or Weibo. Um, and then only after that, you'll have this uh, ha hazard function um, would be a function of the parameters and then you can estimate those parameters. But we don't like that as much because it's kind of arbitrary, right? Which lambda you choose, and it's not based on the data. Um, so then there is another approach that you don't specify lambda at all, okay? And that's what we call a semi-parametric approach because you still keep the part about beta. Uh, however, you eliminate the lambda. So we lambda can be anything, okay? The only thing we need is that uh, we still keep this proportional form that the H, um, right? The H of X, H I T um, equals to lambda zero T times E to the beta X, okay? That's the only thing we need. And this lambda can be anything. Um, however, the hazard model, hazard functions are still proportional to each other because we take this form. Okay, so that's called semi-parametric because uh, we're not parametric about the lambda part. The lambda can be anything. However, we are parametric about this part where it has to take this form um, and it has to be proportional to each other. And then how do we estimate that? So this is not doing the maximum likelihood, but something similar, which is called the partial uh, likelihood. Okay, so what that what is that? Um, that is just take, again, take all of the event times. Uh, so these are the times that somebody have died. And then, um, at that time, there are people who have survived until that time, right? Those are people who could have died at that time. Um, so this is just like before the Kaplan-Meier method. And then you take that sample of the people who have survived until that point, um, and then calculate what is the probability that the person that died among those people is that person. Okay. 
So that's what is here. Um, so you have this set of people. Um, let's just call that set RJ uh, for the event time tau j. So these are the set of people are who are not who have not that uh, before that who have not been censored before that who have we know for sure that have survived until that point. And among those people, they all you can calculate the survival rate for all of them. Okay. I'm not, sorry, the hazard function for all of them. And then um, each of their hazard rate just means the conditional density, which is the probability of them dying at the next second, right? And then among all of those people, it's the jth, jth person that have actually died at that point. And then the probability of among all of those people it is the jth person that dies is just the hazard rate of the jth person divided by the sum of the hazard rate of everybody. Okay, let me repeat. Um, so here, what we have is uh, the probability that this person J dies among all of that people who have survived until that time tau J. And that probability is, um, the hazard rate of this J person divided by the sum of the hazard rate of all of the people. And that's because the hazard rate is basically the probability. Um, it's the probability that the J person dies in the next second divided by the probability that uh, all of the people dies at that um, next second summed up together. Okay. And uh, because this H functions, the hazard rates are all proportional, then this just equals to um, the ratio of J uh, divided by, uh, sorry, the exponential of the beta XJ divided by the exponential of beta XI summed up all together. Okay, does that make sense? Just to make sure that does the numerator included in the denominator? It is, it is. Okay. Because the jth person has to be in that set. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Professor, I just, I just have a general question. Um, when would you use this in like finance? Oh, that's what I said at the beginning, right? So we're gonna, um, so usually it's most often used for the kind of um, credit approval, like the default uh, delinquency. So you can predict when people are gonna default. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so I think the, Cliff Rossi, right, has a ERP in the second year where he uses like the survival analysis very heavily. Um, so that's why, like, I want to teach you some basics here so that um, then you can just uh, build on top of that. And and it's used all the time in the in the like banks, right, where you have um, the credit department, um, and then you have to estimate the actual duration of the loans or the uh, or someone goes someone defaults or goes bankrupt yeah okay um yeah so this rj here is the risk set um so that's the same uh idea as the kaplan meyer method we just talked about Okay, so let's just do another example here. Um, so if, um, yeah, like, so like in this example, right? If you are a bank, um, you are lending to many, many firms or many, many 
uh, consumers, uh, like mortgages. And then you would be very interested in that uh, survival function, right? Like over time, uh, how many of them would have default or how many of them would have uh, bankruptcy? And then you would also be very interested in how the different characteristics of the firm or different characteristics of the uh, borrowers, mortgage borrowers, uh, determine that their survival function. Okay, so the example here, uh, we have 20 firms who borrow a debt at the same time. And then the first firm defaults uh, from one and it defaults after five months. Second firm defaults is from two, uh, defaults after 10 months. Okay, and then what is the thing here, the partial likelihood? So that would just be the risk, um, the hazard rate, right, of the first firm. Uh, so let's call that H1. Um, at that time, uh, tau one, so tau one is five months, and that divide by uh, the total of hazard rate of everybody. So that's I from one to 20, um, HI tau one, right? So this is the partial likelihood of person one uh, of the firm one default at time one. And then multiply this by firm two um, default at time two. And that's divided by the risk set at that time. And then it's from firm two, right? Because firm one is already died and that's no longer in that risk set. So that's from two to 20 um, and HI tau two. And then you can use this formula. Okay, so that would just be equal to E to the beta X one um, over the sum from one to 20 E to the beta X I times e to the beta of x2 divide by the sum of, oh, I'm right, from two to 20 e to the beta of xi. Okay, and that x can be a function of the t or uh, maybe it's time invariant. Um, and that is your partial likelihood, which is a function of beta. Um, and then the thing you do is just to maximize this partial likelihood with respect to beta. And that's your estimate of beta. Okay. So, so here yes. we assume the uh, hazard rate is constant, right? No, we are not assuming the hazard rate is constant. The hazard rate is this function right here. It's lambda zero t times e to the beta x. Okay. Okay. It's not lambda can be anything. But there are two scenarios you mentioned. The first one is that the has has a rate could be constant, right? The here could. right now is yeah. Here right now it's not constant. Oh yeah, here it's not constant because okay. it's uh it depends on x. Okay, so here your tau tau two shall be twenty mount shall be ten mount, right? No rather than five months. Tau two here. Yeah, tau two is 10 months, exactly. Okay, okay. Yes. Um, right. Yeah, and then my second example is if these two times change, um, and then you would just do the same calculation, but you're replacing tau one with the uh, three months and tau two with the eight months. However, it depends on whether your x is time varying. Okay, so whether your x is a function of t or whether x is just 
a time invariant uh, thing. So, for example, if you consider the borrowers, uh, like whether they are male or female, is a time invariant thing, right? Um, so that's not a function of time. However, their income is a function of time. If you only have uh, time invariant axis, and this is actually uh, very commonly used, and then uh, you will see that if you have the first event time to be five months, second one to be 10 months, you would have this function, okay? In this function, you don't see the time here. If X is, as long as X is not a function of time, this is not a function of time. So that um, if you change the first time to be three months, second one to be eight months, this function will be exactly the same. So that's one thing about this Cox proportional hazard model, which is if the X is not varying over time, then your estimation will only depend on the order of people dying, okay? The only thing that matters is firm one defaults first and firm two defaults next. However, the exact time when they default does not matter. So that's partial likelihood. Okay. Um, and then this is just notation for the thing that we just described. Um, for every time point, okay, you calculate what is uh, this number right here, and then you multiply them together for all the time point, for all the event times. And then uh, the beta is the one that maximizes this partial uh, likelihood. So the X, the X there could be a lot of things, right? The X here could be... Could be multiple yeah. sort of X. It depends on... Of course, of course. So there can be a mod, many variables. Dummy uh, or... Uh, yeah, we're, 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 all, all sorts of... Yeah. Professor, can you briefly explain why we maximize the partial likelihood? Yeah. Okay. So the partial likelihood is uh, the probability that someone, so first you see that someone dies at some time and then partial likelihood is the probability that uh, that exact person dies at that time. Okay, among all of the person at risk at that time. And this is not exactly the, this is called the partial likelihood because this is only uh, like the conditional probability, like conditional on all the people have already survived until that point uh, for this set of people. Um, and then what's the person, what's the likelihood that the person who dies is that person, not, not someone else, okay? It's not, um uh, the likelihood uh so the likelihood is the probability that someone dies at some point um but what this circumvents uh is this lambda okay when you calculate the partial likelihood you are getting rid of that lambda mm, okay so and the reason to maximize that partial likelihood because we also want our model uh, to be most consistent with the data we see, right? So uh, we want, for example, if some model um, predicts um, among all of the people who have survived until that point, uh, person J is the one who actually dies. But if some model predicts that person J has very low probability of dying among all of those people, and then that model would be problematic, right? We want to have some model where uh, it predicts the person that exactly dies to die. Like, so that, that way we have the model to be most consistent with the data. Um, 
and sim it's a similar idea as the maximum likelihood yeah i got it thank you um and then it also has some properties just like the maximum likelihood it's consistent it's uh, asymptotically normal means that if you have a huge sample they will have a normal distribution um and it's close to efficient um it's not entirely efficient because we're ignoring some information right we are not uh, doing that lambda and also we're uh, only um, if there's no time varying x we are only considering the order that people died we're not actually considering the exact time where when they died so that's also losing some information so it's not entirely efficient um, and then yeah, the last thing is just what we have already said that um, the estimates only depend on the rank of the event times. So who that first, who that second, et cetera, and not exact numerical value if there is no time varying X. Okay. So that's all. Okay, so to summarize, uh, we, so duration models is just models where you estimate the duration. So you're going to see um, examples on Thursday, um, but there are a lot of examples um, in finance where you would use this model. And for that, first, we can use the two non-parametric methods to estimate the survival function, which is also the CDF, OK? Uh, which, and these two methods are life tables and Kaplan-Meier method. Um, kind of similar. And then uh, to estimate how specific axis, um, like characteristics of the, of the uh, per people or the firms affect the survival rate, uh, we can also use uh, the Cox proportional hazard model. And to estimate that, we can either do the semi-parametric or the parametric, but usually we do the semi-parametric because that's more flexible. Um, we don't have to um, specify what that lambda is. Okay. Um, and it's also easy, easier to compute uh, than, than the full maximum likelihood. Questions? Okay, so on Thursday, we'll do a example. Um, and also we will talk a little bit about how to um, evaluate our prediction uh, for this type of data, because it's also not very obvious, right? For uh, linear regression, you have the mean squared error. Uh, for logit, we talked about using the like ROC curve, but here we have another way to um, to see how good our prediction is, um, like the R squared of, in the linear regression. Um, and then uh, two other things is, uh, one is the solutions of the problem set one has already been posted. And I will, uh, we will try to finish grading them by uh, Thursday or Friday. So then you can, um, you can uh, have them on Elms. And then the second thing is uh, the project has already been posted. So that's already in your uh, Google Drive and also on Elms, okay? So in the Google Drive, you can see several things. I'll just show you very quickly. Um, okay, uh, so that's the group project folder. Um, so the PDF file has everything you need about what to do. Um, and then there's several data uh, data sets. And then there's two spreadsheets. One is uh, your groups. So that's based on which time zone you're in. So there's uh, only one case because there, I think there's two people in Europe, but only two. Um, so I'm putting them together with some people in the US. Uh, but all the other groups, you should be in the, time, in the same uh, time zone. And there's seven groups in total. So you can check that spreadsheet to see uh, who are your teammates. 
And then uh, the second spreadsheet is uh, to sign up for the presentation, which will be on uh, March 4th, which is a Thursday uh, in two weeks. Um, and then uh, we have seven groups, so you can sign up for one of the seven slots, and then we'll go by that order. Okay. Um, and also for each group, we'll have another group to discuss, but I will assign that. Um, okay. Any questions about the logistics or the... So I think you have already finished your reading on problem set one, right? I have. I don't. I don't know that. So Kai is doing that. So I don't know if he has already finished. Okay. Um, so it it may be like some people have already can see their grades, but some people can't. Like it's in, still in process, I guess. Um, Professor, my question on that would be like I received my grades, but there was no feedback on what was wrong. Um, oh. Okay. So that I just wanted to follow up on that. Okay, so I guess uh, I think I've asked him, but I, I'll, I'll make sure. Uh, but the, the, the one thing you can do is just to check the solutions. And uh, if you're still confused about where you got it wrong, you can email either the TA or me. Okay, sure. Okay, but uh, check the solutions first. Professor, can you upload today's slide to? Uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I got a message here too. Um, so, yeah, I will upload it right away. Sorry about that. And I saw that there was supposed to be a reading for today on the syllabus, and that wasn't uploaded either. Uh, well, I think that's for that's for Thursday, right? So it's that's a not Python notebook. Yeah, so it's for Thursday, so it's fine. Sorry, what is it? What is this reading? It says default notebook on Google Drive. Okay, that's the one we're gonna do on Thursday. Um, so no need to read that now. Okay, thanks. 